here is I believe I have the missing piece of the puzzle, if you will, that has been left out in virtually all of these computer programs, and that is the effect of clouds. The 2003 National Academy report uh, totally uh, admitted that they didn't understand it, and they made a whole series of mistake, uh, mistaken statements uh, regarding the effects of clouds. If you look at Al Gore's movie, he insists on talking about a cloud-free Earth, and the only way he can do this, he generates one for the mosaic of photos, uh, each one taken on a cloudless day for, uh, cover, for covering the whole Earth. That's a totally artificial Earth, and is it a totally artificial case for using a model? And this is pretty much what the IPCC and, and, and others use, is a, a cloud-free Earth. If you look at pictures uh, of the Earth in visible light, i.e. real sunlight, which is sunlight is the stuff that heats the Earth. Uh, the infrared re-radiation is the stuff that, that cools the Earth. And it's the balance between these two that controls uh, the Earth's temperature. And the important piece of the puzzle that has been left out is trying to do this all with a cloud-free Earth when the real Earth is shrouded in clouds. I have some pictures, I don't know if you can uh, show them, of satellite pictures of the Earth. These are all freely available on NASA's uh, website. And they show cloud cover variations anywhere from 5 to 95 percent. Typically, the Earth is shrouded in clouds uh, at least between a third of its uh, area to two thirds of its area. And this, and this, it fluctuates. The cloud cover fraction fluctuates uh, quite dramatically on daily, weekly time scales. We call this weather. It, 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 you can't have weather without having clouds. And it is this fluctuation in cloud cover of the Earth that causes what I would refer to as sunlight reflectivity thermostat that controls the climate, controls the temperature of the Earth, and stabilizes it uh, very uh, powerfully and very dramatically of uh, this mechanism, totally uh, uh, heretofore unnoticed, uh, and I call it kind of a, an elephant in the room hiding in plain sight that nobody seems to have noticed. Uh, I can't imagine why, why not, but there were similar elephants in the room in quantum mechanics that I discovered. So the variation in the cloud cover, uh, the, the importance in the actual power balance is 200 times more powerful than the uh, effect, uh, the small effect by comparison of CO2. And I might add also of methane. They're all, methane and CO2 are comparable in the, uh, in the total heat loss. So I, let me give you an example of, uh, of how, how this mechanism works. Okay, first off, you have to notice that the Earth is two-thirds ocean. And that's where most of the, cloud, the importance of the clouds comes in. Sunlight is the heating mechanism. Clouds appear bright white. Brown oceans, etc., are very dark and reflect very little light. But clouds reflect 90% of the sunlight that hits them gets reflected back out into space where it no longer comes to the Earth, no longer heats the Earth. Say you only got a, a third of uh, cloud cover. So you now have lots and lots of sunlight. Sunlight impinging on the ocean evaporates seawater. Seawater forms water vapor. The water vapor floats up to the, up into the sky and forms clouds. It forms lots and lots of clouds because the cloud uh, creation rate is very high. But we started out with too low a set of clouds, and now we have an increasing number, so now we end up with very high cloud coverage. Okay, so now say it's two-thirds. Well, 
Let me give you an example. If you want to try to read a book on an overcast day, indoors, without turning the lights on, it's just too dark. You can't do it without turning the lights on. The question is, where did all that sunlight go? It's coming in scattered light coming in through the window, but boy, it's a lot darker now. So uh, where did it go? There's only one place. It got scattered back out into space where it's no longer uh, hitting the Earth. So, okay, so we now have the total power input coming to the Earth is now much, much smaller. Okay, well, this is happening on the oceans too. If you have large c cloud cover, you have a lot of shadows, clouds create shadows. You can see this by standing on a, a watching clouds pass over. Well, the oceans are now shadowed. The shadows don't have enough energy to evaporate anywhere near as much water. So if we have too much cloud cover, then the, oh, we reduce the evaporation rate of water. And so that then re reduces the production of cloud. So we now have these two competing clouds. Okay, so the, the power loss is like 104 watts per square meter when we only have a third cloud cover and 208 watts per square meter of surface area of the Earth when we have a very low cloud cover. So the difference between those is the order of 104 watts per square meter of surface area. That it needs to be compared with this minuscule half a watt per square meter of surface area there that CO2 contributes. So the power in this thermostat, in terms of what they refer to as radiative forcing, so these are the how many watts per square meter of surface area uh, are, are involved, is 200 times more powerful than the effect of CO2, and also methane, by the way. So I then uh, assert that this is so powerful. I mean, it's like you have a, your house has a huge furnace with a very uh, accurate thermostat controlling the, uh, uh, its temperature, and somebody leaves a minor, a uh, small bathroom window, and there's a small heat leak uh, would you, the rest of the house, notice a, ch a change in temperature? None of your thermostat is working very well. This is clearly the most important, the controlling uh, mechanism for the Earth's temperature and, and climate, and it dwarfs the effect of CO2 and methane. All the government programs that are designed to uh, limit CO2 and methane should be immediately uh, dropped. We're spending trillions of dollars on this, and it's sort of like Everett Dirksen's famous line, you know, a trillion here, a trillion there, uh, and pretty soon you're, you're talking real money. Dr. Klauser, let me jump in here for a moment. Are you saying, sure. and it's, it's kind of common sense that cloud cover would play a role in these IPCC climate models, but are you suggesting that in none of these models, uh, the cloud cover is actually included? In, indeed, and in fact, uh, Kunin mentions this uh, in, in, his, uh, in his book, they really didn't mention anything uh, in the uh, early IPCC reports. Uh, and finally, like in 2013, in the so-called AR5 report, they finally got a big section on clouds. And none of these uh, uh, properties that I have just mentioned, the fact that we have this huge fluctuation in cloud cover, the fact that the cloud reflectivity uh, is varying by this huge amount of power loss out into space, none of that is, is mentioned. They all, all these models, and they've gone to great effort on, in saying, uh, saying, well, the Earth's albedo, okay, that's the ref average reflectivity of sunlight, if you will, the re reflectivity uh, fraction of sunlight. Uh, they all say, well, what is it? And it's 0.3, and it's 
And even Kunin mentions, gee, you know, if we somehow had got uh, raised to 0.31, uh, that would uh, buy, and that would only take a 5% increase in average uh, cloud cover, uh, that would uh, totally wipe out uh, any of the effects of, of say, doubling uh, CO2. Uh, <laughs> nobody this seems to notice that there's this huge variation from like 5% to 95% uh, cloud cover quite visible. Uh, and it's, uh, I have no idea how could they, they, they could have missed that. 